So the central sort of uh, theme or argument of this, this essay, if I don't make it clear enough, is that uh, I suggest that uh, science fiction narratives or, or science fiction, what will become science fiction later, uh, written in the 19th century, uh, can provide sort of a corrective narrative guide for its readers, um, at least some of it. So we'll see if that comes out here. In 1851, the writer Agnes Callow wrote of the microscope, quote, at the end of the tunnel, we find other portals, much smaller. When they're opened, we're in the new world spoken of, and now I see your astonishment. Your minds are bewildered with a variety of new beings and forms." End quote. A few years later, in 1858, Fitzjames O'Brien publishes The Diamond Lens, a proto-science fiction story in the Atlantic Monthly. It's one part Poe, one part of something that sounds what would later be um, H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, O'Brien's story on the surface is of a man who creates a microscope so powerful that it, pe it appears, or I'm sorry, it peers down beyond the ordinary cells deep to the subatomic level. There, the narrator sees this new beautiful world and encounters a woman who he falls in love with, um, and he becomes obsessed with freeing her. Except that the being dies, he descends into madness, and that's the end of the story. Um, Though Brian's narrative is really kind of fascinating as, a, as an example of early science fiction, it, it exposes the uncertainty and anxiety among readers about scientific advances that were becoming increasingly specialized as experimental practice moved away from the more Republican perceptions of the world based on gentleman scientists of the nation's founding and toward technology and techniques that advocated for regimented training and increased specialization. In doing so, these practices re reveal fresh questions about the nature of the universe, who could understand and unlock them. O'Brien's story serves as a microcosm of this evolution. His story interrogates the intersection of professionalism, technology, and spirituality uh, to expose the bewilderment Keller writes of. Publication of the Diamond Lens occurs at the height of reorganization uh, within the American scientific community. Building since the turn of the 19th century, science in general had been undergoing a series of seismic shocks, ranging from shifting education, more education, less education, uh, licensing, unlicensing, uh, incorporation of spiritual folk practices and others. Um, and then this idea that uh, previous to the 19th century, most discovery had application to industry. That's what, that's what it pur its purpose was, discover something use it to make money or to further the world. Um, and science in the 19th century wasn't operating that way all the time. It wasn't always apparent how some new discoveries in the second half of the 19th century especially would come to fit into this mold. These debates were happening within the specialized magazines and popular press of the time. And it wasn't uncommon for a reader to see an article about advances in science one month and then a short story about that same advance uh, the next month or a few months later. In this way, readers were exposed to both the fact of advancement and the speculation of how it might um, affect society. Readers of periodical fiction were as varied as the, as the publications themselves. By mid-century, the popular number is literacy had grown to 80% of adults. To respond to this demand, a number of publications rose to meet it. However, magazines were still relatively new format. Um, and as Susan Belasco observes, quote, magazines could never offer the timeliness of the increasing number of daily newspapers, nor did they have the cultural authority of books. The middle space, however, is precisely where periodicals such as The Atlantic could thrive in publishing work that held wide appeal and responded to more than daily concerns. That is, a savvy publication would observe and print topics about, uh, or I'm sorry, would observe and print topics that were both newsworthy and held broader cultural interest to its readers. Additionally, the format allowed for deeper exploration of any given subject than any daily publication. And in this way, periodicals were more flexible than the book and newspaper, even if they lacked the authority of those. Scientific topics in particular were in high demand among readers, especially those that touted new discovery and potential application. One of those emerging, emerging fields in the 19th century is microscopy. Though the microscope had existed for a few hundred years at that point, it wasn't uh, available as an instrument for the everyday person until the 19th century when you could order it via catalog and it would arrive at your home. Um, O'Brien's story appears in print at the exact moment that narratives of the microscopic discovery and fiction were most popular with readers. As Wade Kim points out in his introduction to the Diamond Lens, prior to the story's publication, Harper's had recently published two illustrated articles describing the fruits of microscopic study, and one of them had, its, its, had specifically examined uh, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek, who appears prominently, at least in spiritual form, um, in O'Brien's um, story. 
Additionally, in the run-up to the 1850s, the Scientific American published a number of articles across its issues covering everything from using diamonds as lenses, creatures that could be found in magnified water, and the commercial value of the microscope. Certainly then, readers were engaged in both the factual and fictional accounts of advances in science and how they could apply to their everyday lives. However, rather than tell straight tale of science, uh, O'Brien blends his tale with otherworldly concerns, those of the place of the supernatural and how spiritual fits into this category. And O'Brien himself was no stranger to the supernatural. For a brief period, he wrote uh, for the New York Times, and he wrote an article in 1855 called Among the Soothsayers, where he and his partner went around the city to various uh, mediums that were advertised, and he de debunked each of them. Uh, it's a really interesting study in how he sort of viewed uh, gender and race in the medium. Uh, we don't have time for that here, but it's, uh, it's, it, it becomes part of what he uh, depicts in the diamond lens. He clearly bases his medium in the diamond lens off of one of the people he looked at it that evening. O'Brien himself arrived on America's shores from Ireland as an immigrant. He saw the best and worst the country had to display in the new stratification of the medical and wider scientific communities, where earlier scientists found that medical training provided the best base for study, as specialized education in other areas was rare and uneven, so they'd be doctors so they could study other areas of science, for instance. Uh, Would-be practitioners of the mid-19th century found more school, schools attempting the European model of disciplines. Trained specialists were quickly re replacing apprentices. Still, there was pushback in the form of poor enrollment and continued competition from uh, the European schools that the American colleges sought to model. Further, expanding uh, popular readership and the pressures toward professionalization urged the public to see the vocation as the terminal point of extensive study, which was a departure from the norm of appre apprenticeship and scientific study for some, not all, as a form of Republican leisure. O'Brien saw this tension as an opportunity for his fiction, or he might, might have anyway. His response to the creation uh, was the creation of a fictionalized mad scientist at the center of this breakdown. Jack Fennell in Mad Science and Empire argues that O'Brien's experiences before leaving Ireland, particularly the famine in the early 1850s, and his self-portrayal as an Irish revolutionary are part of the reason that O'Brien, quote, ha apparently has no problem juxtaposing scientific fact with mysticism, end quote. However, juxtaposition, as Fennell calls it, is conveniently mirrored in the American reading public. They sought information from all corners, local gossip, newspapers, books, and the periodical press alike. Willingness by many of O'Brien's readers to blend modes of knowledge reflected a larger trend to fold disparate models of science and exploration into regulated and specialized professions. That O'Brien's narrator doesn't subscribe to that newer model of professionalism indicates that the writer sees the mission of empire and the goal of establishing a professional specialized class as having the similar destabilizing tendencies. An evolving trope in popular fiction at the time, uh, the mad scientist pushed against the boundaries erected by structured learning. The result was an individual who relied on tireless self-study, inspiration, and a loathing for the established science. As Fennel puts it, the mad scientist's role is to, quote, expose hidden truths, and that, quote, he derides those who do not appreciate the value of his work, be they members of the uneducated public or, or unimaginative ignoramuses within the scientific community. Madness or deep obsession then becomes the door through which discovery, true discovery, can only take place. O'Brien has taken this lesson here from both Shelley and Poe in how his protagonist approaches this knowledge and even goes so far as to slip a sly reference to Frankenstein in the story. Uh, he marks the year, the vintage of wine he uses to poison his friend, we'll get to that in a minute, as 1818, which is the year Frankenstein is published. Uh, within the diamond lens, there are several moments that are worth examining for significance, but uh, due to time, I'm going to focus on uh, just a couple of here. Specifically, obtaining knowledge, uh, the use of the supernatural, and the consequences for working outside of the established scientific structure. Told in the first person, Lindley narrates his own discovery and demise in a style clearly influenced by the likes of Poe. Lindley tells his early interest in magnification when a cousin constructs a rudimentary mi microscope from a coin and a drop of water. Fascinated, Lindley obtains an actual microscope and begins examining every mold, fungus, and liquid he can find. However, his parents want to force him into an occupation, so he says he's going to go become a doctor. Uh, in the opening paragraphs, O'Brien contrasts formalized science with the older model of apprenticeship. The narrator explains, Lindley explains, quote, as long as I paid my academy fees, I might shirk attending the lectures if I chose, and as I never had the remotest intention of standing for an examination, there was no danger of my being plucked. 
Rather than attend classes as was the norm, O'Brien's narrator instead sought, quote, excellent instruments and in newest publications and intimacy with, the friend, with men of pursuits of kindred to my own. The narrator is diminishing the role of formal schooling in favor of recasting the purpose of being in a major metropolitan center. Robert Bruce highlights this fact in the 19th century, saying, quote, the city was a natural habitat of the scientist, and that areas like Boston and New York outproduced other areas in terms of scientific advancement. O'Brien's narrator then is seeking technology and expertise, not camaraderie with the other students. Uh, this marks stark difference in his view as a trained practitioner of the mid-19th century as a trade and reclaims the role of, quote, learned man of the pre-19th century who might practice medicine and science as a hobby. In fact, Lindley romanticizes those at the top of their respective fields as, quote, men of science and sets out to emulate them instead. Of course, in any, idea, any kind of emulation of the intellectual, there must be the outward appearance of learning. So Lindley obtains a pretty apartment, which he furnishes, quote, simply but rather elegantly, and then focuses on, quote, the adornment of the temple of his worship with the finest in instruments. Throughout the text, he has no consideration for the practicality of any of these instruments and even admits, at least in one place, that he, has, he, doesn't, have, he doesn't even know how to use most of them. Um, the narrator doesn't want a professional title, only the trappings of the imagined professional. All this argues for a kind of anti-intellectualism where the established academic stru structure is incapable of serving a man like Lindley. His refusal to learn from a professional to lead him naturally, uh, leads him naturally to becoming frustrated with his own progress. He claims to have solved a variety of problems that stumped his peers, uh, but his hubris eclipses his active participation within the community of scientists who might actually help him. Instead, he seems only invested in his social life of his neighbor, Jules Simon. Uh, Lindley presents Simon as a fantastic, if problematic fig figure. Simon is inexplicably wealthy, likely Jewish, and possibly involved in the slave trade. He doesn't commit to any of these, but it's heavily hinted at in the story. Uh, his questionable social position makes Simon perfect for the role of bridging the logical world of science and the supernatural. When Simon brings up the medium Matt of Volpe's, um, uh, Lindley sees his way to solve his problem, to get over this hurdle he's been facing. Volpe is an exotic in her own right, com completes the social outcast triumvirate that O'Brien sets up. While Lindley is a rogue scientist and Simon is an illicit business dealer, uh, Volpe represents unorthodox spirituality. When Lindley enters, she seats him at a table and begins a seance. Meanwhile, being a man of science, uh, he is a skeptic, and he covertly writes the name of the spirit he wishes to speak with. After some table shaking and tremored writing from Volpe's, she produces a slip of paper with the name Lewenhoke, the uh, microscopist. Um, it's the same name that Lindley has secretly written under the table. Shocked that Volpe's, a quote, uncultivated woman, should know the name of this man, Lindley writes a series of questions regarding the construction of this powerful microscope that he wants. Volpe's or Lewenhoek's spirit via the medium answers Lindley's questions, which the latter fa faithfully recounts in the order in which they occurred. Throughout this exchange, Lindley is engaged in surface, surface skepticism in the name of science, misguided as it may be, but readily accepts the answers with no follow-up at all. Lewenhoek communicates the only way to achieve magnification that Lindley seeks is to drill a hole in a diamond and, quote, the image will be formed in pierced space, which will itself serve as a tube to look through. Lindley leaves the medium in a state of painful nervous exultation, hurries home to devise a plan for acquiring the necessary rare stone. As with before, Lindley questions nothing here. Uh, he attempts to apply some biological reasoning that could explain Volpe's communication, but he's unwilling or unable to do so, and he, to come to any satisfactory conclusion, he just proceeds with it. Uh, instead, he immediately assumes the authentic communication, uh, and through the course of the story, he's become increasingly, or increasingly reliant on these unorthodox methods. Uh, the problem is Lindley sees it as how to acquire such a valuable stone. He can't afford it. Uh, but Simon has such a stone, his friend. Um, unable to convince Simon to sell it, Lindley poisons him with an overdose of laudanum, stages the scene to resemble a suicide, and steals the diamond. Lindley justifies the murder of his friend as both necessary in the name of scientific advancement and as a good to society due to Simon's potentially questionable character. He's just doing us a favor. Uh, with the diamond in hand, he constructs a powerful microscope. Placing a drop of water on the device, he finds only, quote, beautiful inorganic forms and foliated clouds with the highest rarity. He soon finds a single human shape whose, quote, adorable beauty lifted it illimitable heights beyond the loveliest daughter of Adam. 
As the days go by, he becomes obsessed with the figure, imagining her as being imprisoned in her microscope space, naming her Animulia, uh, which is a slightly altered version of the microscopic Animalia. It inserts the Greek mu based on the Egyptian glyph for water. It is in this moment that the story begins to resemble other lost world tales, with Lindley setting himself up as the potential god king of the realm he discovered. Uh, Lindley's obsession with Animulia distracts him from the practicalities of actually, actually caring for the world he discovers, and so he goes out, he comes back from this trip, and he sees Animulia dying because the water is drying up in the slide. Uh, it seems to never occur to him to add more water to the slide, but that's fine. Um, so he watches her death, and he destroys all of his uh, equipment in a, in a fit of grief and rage. At the end of the story, Lindley declares, quote, they say now that I am mad, but they are mistaken. Destitute, he relies on charity and the occasional speaking engagement. Lindley comments that he is only invited to speak when, quote, young men's associations that love a joke want entertainment. Finally, through transgression and trauma rather than education and study, he's earned the title, quote, Lindley the Mad Microscopist, completing his arc and ending O'Brien's story. Through the course of the narrative, O'Brien paints a picture of the mad scientist who moves beyond the bounds of the established regulated science and pays the price with his sanity. Returning to Jack Fennell then, he, quote, belongs to a learned class of society whose privilege is true understanding of scientific principles. If he is not appreciated or understood by his peers, it's because his comprehension of the world exceeds theirs to the extent that he is, for all intents and purposes, a shaman or a wizard. Finally, in March of 1885, one C.F. Fox, a reader, uh, sent a letter to the editors of Science Magazine. The magazine, it seems, had published a previous article that argued that microscope users were not, quote, real scientists. Uh, in his retort, Cox writes that he is, quote, acquainted with a number of cultivated and educated men, both professional and amateur, who use the microscope carefully for advancement of knowledge. And further, some are part of microscope societies that Cox asserts are, quote, engaged in very nearly the same kind of work that science, the magazine, is engaged in, but that none have been eager to be labeled, quote, regular scientific men. Cox argues that just because one using the instrument is not a geologist or an astronomer, he uses both of those examples, uh, it does not mean that the microscopist, professional or amateur, is a simple tradesman with a crude tool, which is his main sort of beef with Science Magazine. Uh, though the dime, through the diamond lens, O'Brien lends his voice to those who wish to oppose the establishment of a professional scientific class at the loss of the romantic Republican scientist, but Lindley uh, pushes back against the stratification of the scientific professional. O'Brien recognizes and warns of the madness that follows too quick and unearned advancement and cautions his readers of the potential consequences of such reckless actions, one without the necessary guardrails. O'Brien may not be a supporter of stratis stratified scientific profession, but he also recognizes the dangers of unexamined and unearned advancement. Thank you.